Welcome to our Saturday simulcast, July 16th version, and uh, joined by Brian Newbert, who is playing Hurt this week. Uh, we'll talk about or talk about that a little bit. His ball, his, his uh, namesake, Patient Zero. He's not quite Patient Zero, but to him he is, and uh, he's been battling COVID this week, and, and as only Brian can do, still produce content on our site, but being quarantined and, and being in a sa- as safe as possible spot. Uh, I want to thank our sponsors, the Union Club Hotel, for joining us for another uh, year. We appreciate them and Vicki Wicks. They've got a lot of things going on at uh, the 811 Bistro, but also the Boiler Up Bar. We're going to do a couple of Facebook Lives there this year. In fact, uh, I think we're going to do one the night before the night before opening day again when Purdue plays uh, Penn State, which would be September 1st. But the the uh, Facebook Live uh, will be will be uh, August 31st. So we appreciate them and all that they do. Brian, uh, you've had a, an interesting week by definition. It started out uh, a week ago uh, when you were on the road uh, and was at Rock Hill, South Carolina, saw Jakari Harris and some others uh, play. Uh, pretty good commitment from Jack Benner. You talked to David Jenkins on, on Monday. So still an eventful week from that standpoint. But first and foremost, uh, how in the heck are you feeling? I mean, uh, <laughs> how's, this, how's this process been for you? Yeah, I'm on the back end of it now, I think. I think if I tested tonight, I would test negative. But um, this is obviously my first experience with it. Um, but it's been kind of a blur. Uh, Monday was yeah. atrocious. It was an absolute yeah. disaster. Um, actually went out to basketball practice that late morning um, and then came back and just completely shut down. And uh, hopefully I didn't uh, spread this to anyone out there. Obviously, I've I've informed all of the people who need to know of my situation but um when i came home monday it was over i was just yeah in bed and um conscious for uh brief instances here and there enough to text people <laughs> to let them know hey i just tested positive for covid watch your ass kind of stuff <laughs> yeah. but uh um and then i went to sleep and the next i knew it it was like tuesday evening so uh uh, and I've probably been awake a total of 12 to 15 hours um, since then. And I'm, it's pretty great when I'm asleep because I have absolutely nothing to do in isolation here. I'm losing my mind. This is my first face-to-face human interaction in four or five days um, outside of the bedroom door opening up every now and then and a bag being thrown in. <laughs> um, yeah, those pictures have been good <laughs> on uh, your social media. That was my kitchen. Um, yeah. So, uh, I'm doing okay. It could have been a lot worse. I mean, I, it could have been a lot worse. I wish I'd gotten more sleep, uh, the week prior to this happening. Um, but I've been pretty fortunate. I'm going to come out of this. Okay. Uh, we'll see what, uh, uh, I don't know how how long it's going to last, how long I'm going to be coughing. Um, but it certainly could have been worse. So I'm definitely not going to whine about this or anything like that. Uh, people have had it a lot worse than me. Uh, you know, um, looking forward to being over though i want to get out of this room yeah i hear you i hear you. a couple of months ago when i had it it was uh, somewhat similar it's hard to compare apples to apples here but uh, yeah it'll it lingers for a bit as too as well but uh, hopefully you're going to continue on the mend you sound good well, and, uh, i am extremely thankful um to jack benner last night he committed a few weeks before i expected him to commit so i wasn't prepared yeah. for it but he did it during the four hours i was awake so <laughs> that was that was that that was a positive thing um yeah yeah you got to look for the positive things when it comes to that kind of stuff and uh, i guess that's what we'll start with first uh, uh today jack bender obviously you've seen him play uh you as you've said and written not a great surprise that he picked Purdue. maybe the fact that uh, or that he committed to Purdue, i should say and uh, he did it a little bit earlier than maybe you'd anticipated but uh Give us a thumbnail of what Purdue's getting in him. Of course, a class of 2022, 24 guard, I should say, uh, from Brownstown, uh, Indiana. Yeah, he's. Uh, I expected this to happen at the end of the month, um, but I think as soon as Purdue offered him, it was that was the one he was looking for. That's the one he was going to take, and uh, easy to see what why Purdue was so uh, quickly drawn to him. I think this would have. I think they would have offered him weeks before they actually did if their scholarship numbers were more clear. I don't know <laughs> if anybody in college basketball anymore has clear scholarship numbers, but Purdue's are yeah. especially murky because of the COVID years possibility sitting there uh, for all, all of its four current juniors. 
but Bender is kind of the, you know, I, I hate just lumping these guys all together. Um, yeah. But it's so much easier to make sense of things that way. But like the Dakota Mathias is the Ryan Kleins. He's very much cut from that same cloth in terms of a guy who's a really good shooter, but more so just a really good all around offensive basketball player. He can handle the ball. He plays point guard for his high school. He can, uh, he can really pass. He can really dribble. He can really shoot. Um, and those are the sorts of things that have really been important for Purdue uh, over the years offensively, not just the shot making, but the offensive savvy, the offensive, <laughs> the term I like to use is offensive lubricant. They just make you a yeah. better offensive team. Like uh, uh, things run more smoothly with guys like that out there. Uh, high, high basketball IQ guys who do a lot of different things offensively. But the difference between Jack Benner and the other guys Purdue's had there <clears throat> I think is he's a big guy. He's six four, six five, probably 190, 195, but he really plays physically. And you don't really see that very often in that category of player. Um, he really attacks people on post-ups, which as a basketball observer, there's a special, I have a special affinity in my heart for guards who post up. I've always, yeah. I've always said that. That's what I loved about Etuan Moore. It's what I loved about the Kona Mathias. And, um, you know, I, I think Jack Benner is, he really does that well. He really attacks mismatches that way, and he's good at it. He has legitimate post moves. Uh, he plays really physically. He he doesn't let people off the hook for being smaller and less physical than he is. And at the high school level, most guards are going to qualify as that. Um, he's a good rebounder for that reason because, be, because he's a big kid. He, he's a physical kid. He follows his own misses. Um it's such a matchup driven game nowadays, basketball at all levels, uh, college basketball, especially nowadays that any advantage you have, um, you know, is, is a really important one. And I think that if this is a guy that you get matched up on guards on, you know, true guards on, you know, smaller guys, um, you can really take advantage of that. I, you know, I, I, obviously it's, it's one thing to, you know, have offense run through you as a post-up player for your high school, for your grassroots program, whatever it might be at this level, but uh, versus what he would be facing at the college level. But I think there, there's a real possibility here. This is a guy that Purdue could look for mismatches for at the next level, run offense through him in the post and kind of do things a little bit differently. Now, it's easy to say that. You could have done that with Dakota Mathias, but is – is posting up Dakota Mathias your best option when you have Caleb Swanigan and you have AJ Hammonds and Isaac Haas? You know, that that's kind of the that that's kind of the question you have. But I do think this is a guy who can create favorable matchups for himself offensively. And I also think defensively, because he's so big and because he's so physical and because he's so strong, he's going to be a little bit more interchangeable defensively than some of those other guys um, who uh, you know maybe weren't the quickest laterally or the best guys defensively in switches or the quickest footed guys, the Kendall Stevens, the Sasha Stefanovic's, the Ryan Kleins. Obviously Dakota Mathias became a really good defender. Um, but earlier in his career, he was that way, that kind of thing. I think he can be, he, he can be the offensive plus those guys were without being as much of uh, the defensive minus some of those guys were also. Yeah, obviously he had the chance last week too in in South Carolina to see Jakari Harris, a, a Purdue legacy son of Glenn Robinson, and a guy that uh, also in that class of 2024. Um, what do you see there? And and I and I know it's there's going to be a lot of people after him as well, and already are. But uh, uh, what do you see from 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 what he brings to the table? And I'm, it's probably too early to ask how he compliments what a Jack Benner and, and what that 24 class is going to end up looking like. But uh, uh, how do you view uh, what you saw from him uh, last weekend? Well, first, one more point about Benner that you, you yeah. just kind of walked me into. I think he's the type of guy who you can put with any other types of players and he would fit in well because he can do – he's kind of like Fletcher Lawyer in the sense that he can yeah. handle the ball, he can shoot the ball, he can pass the ball, he can play off the ball, he can play with the ball kind of stuff like that. And guys like that, you can put next to anyone. You can put next to an athletic wing like a Cannon Catchings, and they would complement each other really well because Jack Benner would give you the ball handler that Cannon Catchings might not. Cannon Catchings would give you the athleticism that Jack Benner maybe 
wouldn't as much. I think you can put him with any set of personnel, play any type of style, and and he, you know, he would be able to fit in pretty well. Jakari Harris um, would be an unbelievable addition for Purdue if, if they're able to get him because I think the toughness he plays with. Um, that one other point to make about Jack Benner, I think he's a really tough kid. I, if I didn't say that yeah. before, for that position, you know, yeah, that position at times has been a little bit, you know. Uh, I don't want to say soft, but not exactly, uh, not exactly the, the position you were lo- relying on for toughness. Um, but I, I don't think I, I don't think Jack Benner is going to be deficient there. Um, Jakari Harris would be one of those tone setters from a defensive perspective. I think he could be really good on the ball as a defender. I think he's a big, strong, physical, tenacious guy, very similar to Keaton Grant back in the day. What he was able to give Purdue defensively. Um, and I think he loves it. I, I think he enjoys doing it. And I think, you know, Purdue would love to have that guy on the ball, uh, from a defensive perspective, they've got to get better defensively. Look, they have, they have moved culturally, whether Matt Painter would admit to this or not, because he is a defensive coach at heart. He's going to coach us like a def- defensive program at all times, but they have moved philosophically, culturally, whatever it might be toward offense and you've seen right. them have to adjust from a defensive perspective to make up some gaps for that are created by what they have out there offensively they're playing really big at center obviously for offensive reasons they've had uh, a lot of shooters out there over the years that have you know been a little bit deficient against the dribble things like that so they, they've had to configure their defense a little bit that's probably the way you're going now i i, I think the days of 1990s purdue defense or early 2000s, mid 2000s, Purdue defense, uh, brain fog here. I, I've completely lost, uh, <laughs> I've excused. completely lost track of, uh, the time space continuum here. Um, I think, I think the days of mid 2000s, early Matt Painter era defense are probably yeah. over. The rules have changed. The game has changed. I think what Purdue's doing defensively now is kind of the new norm. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't have guys who are better wired to do it. And I think Jakari Harris would, fall in line wonderfully in that regard because he's got a little bit of no gel Eastern potential in him from a defensive perspective, but also really valuable um, offensive skills too. He's a really good three point shooter. Um, I think he's, he's, I don't know what he shot in high school, but every time I've watched him play, he's probably been a 40, 45% type of guy in the grassroots games I've seen can really shoot the basketball, um, can really use his body well to score. He's not going to blow by anyone. He's not going to be that high ball screen guy that that's going to get downhill and, and beat everyone to the rim. Um, but Purdue doesn't need that. You know, Purdue needs a decision maker. Purdue needs a shooter. Purdue needs a game manager, you know, for lack of a better term, somebody who's going to take care of the basketball and somebody who's going to guard people, who's going to yeah. set a defensive tone. Uh, for the entire game. And I think that's exactly what Jakari Harris is. And that's a big part of the reason that, you know, uh, Purdue's all in on him. He's just kind of a winner, you know, and I, I think that's the highest compliment you can give a player. Yeah. Again, a guy that, uh, I, would, and I know it's, well, I don't know that it's early, but everybody in the world's out looking at him. I mean, who, who will be Purdue's biggest competition or, uh, or who will be Purdue will, will Purdue be in competition with is better said, because I'm not saying well, Purdue's the favorite here. It is really early. I, I, I mean, I don't want to say Purdue's the favorite here. I think Purdue's made yeah. a really good impression, uh, but I also think Purdue recruits very differently than the other people recruiting him. I think the SEC has their way of doing things. Um, I think they kind of – they're not as big into, you know, recruiting a guy his whole career and building a relationship with him and, you know, showing up for all his games and showing him how much he's wanted and things like that. I think the SEC kind of more just like kind of shows up at the end and, you know – whatever happens, happens. Um, but I think the fact that, you know, Purdue's calling this dude every day, um, um, and, you know, showing up to all his games and, uh, is going to get him on campus here for an official visit in the fall. I think that's kind of put them ahead of the pack right now. Now they're going to have to, they're going to have to get him away from Georgia as a new staff. They're going to have, you know, uh, that kind of enthusiasm bump, uh, with Mike White taking over there, uh, Auburn just offered him, obviously, uh, Auburn's one of the most successful programs in the country here the last couple of years. Um, 
Mississippi has been on them for a while. A lot of those SEC teams, you know, um, I, I, I think over time, you know, if, if he keeps shooting the basketball the way he shoots the basketball, you know, he might um, get a lot more. But I think it's probably going to it's probably going to be, you know, Purdue versus uh, that group of kind of SEC people there. Uh, I, I would have to think George is going to make a huge run at him. Um, but I, I, I think Purdue's got some advantages because I think that Purdue, even though it's you know, way out of the way from where he lives right now outside Atlanta. I think Jalen Robinson uh, is really helping them. Um, he and uh, and Harris have apparently be- become close because of their their shared history, their shared lineage um, as Glenn Robinson's sons, and um, I think that uh, that's helped Purdue. I think Jakari Harris over time will come to realize too that the way he plays basketball is very compatible with what Purdue has been historically. He's, he's a great fit for what Purdue does, you know, things like that. And, um, I think Purdue's going to make a really compelling claim here now, whether or not at the end of the day, uh, the player is going to be okay with his, 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 his lineage following him everywhere he goes at Purdue, you know, that's something he's going to have to decide, but you know, he's obviously come this far with Purdue without that being something that has, has, has not given uh, Purdue um, or has not precluded him from being really interested in Purdue is, is what I should say. I I think Purdue's going to have a real chance there. The official visit in the fall is going to be huge. Um, I don't have any reason to think that anything is in the works for a decision to be made anytime soon. So this is probably going to be a long process. All right. The other uh, person you talked to before all things went south for your health on uh, Monday night, David Jenkins, just your overall impression of him. And you talked to him a little bit also about point guard play, et cetera. But uh, just uh, again, of course, David being the newcomer uh, and the transfer from Utah that'll be joining the Boilermaker has already joined Purdue's basketball program and be working with the, uh, the 2022-23 team. Impressions of David and, and what you, you know, early on, how you see he will fit in or if anything's changed uh, early on to what, uh, what he will, what role he'll play this year. Yeah. I, I didn't see him play. I just talked to him yeah. for a while. Yeah. Um, I did watch a bunch of his games after he committed. So I, I yeah. have a pretty good idea of what he's capable of or what he's all about as a player. But as a person, I think that, you know, he, he's got a real energy about him. He's got a real positive energy about him. He's got a real big personality. And, you know, I, I think this is a Purdue team that um, has to kind of find itself in that regard. It has to kind of cultivate a new personality, kind of a new identity. And, uh, you know, given everything they lost from last year's team, um, I think having an older guy who is going to have some charisma about him is going to have some life experience about him. Is going to have some wisdom about him, maybe provided all of that stuff goes in the right direction. Um, because sometimes when a guy comes in for his last year, if things don't go the way he hoped they would, you know, that could go a couple different ways on you. But, um, based on my one conversation with him in, in conjunction with everything I've heard about him prior to actually meeting him, um, he seems like a really positive guy who's here for all the right reasons, um, who chose Purdue for all the right reasons, who sees this as a pretty good opportunity, who understands that his career, you know, hasn't necessarily been a straight line. And, uh, you know, uh, this is his fourth school. And I, I think he's got, um, he's got a decent explanation as to why that is. Obviously he followed his coach from one school to the other, and then that coach left. So he went to another school. Um, that's kind of the nature of college basketball nowadays, but I think yeah. that, um, you know, I think from a personality and a leadership perspective, I, I think there's some potential there. But from a playing perspective, you know, Purdue's going to apparently try him at point guard a little bit. Um, you know, Purdue, I've said this over and over again, you know, Purdue's not your your prototypical, you know, point guard you type of school where uh, they demand as much from that position as everybody else. If you just take care of the basketball, you get people in offense, things like that, and you guard the ball, um, Purdue's produce getting its baseline of what it needs. Um, can he do that stuff? Yeah, probably. Uh, it, it would be really hard for me to guess cause I've, I've never seen him do it. Yeah. Um, 
but if his pedigree of shot making too translates to this level and there's no reason to think it wouldn't, um, it's not like Purdue doesn't need that too. It's not like Purdue doesn't need somebody else who can score uh, because as much as Purdue has needed a point guard, um, you also need scorers uh, because you've, you lost the majority of your scorers from last year, obviously you have Zach Eady back, but you need somebody in your backcourt, you know, who can put the ball in the basket. And uh, for as much as ho- Purdue hopes for from Brandon Newman, you know, you're, you're still three months removed from him being outside your playing rotation or four months removed, five months removed, however long it's been. Um, so he still has a lot to prove. Fletcher Lawyer is a freshman, obviously. So uh, it's not like Purdue didn't need somebody else here who can also give you a little bit of punch offensively. So if he can help you overcome your deficiencies at point guard on paper, if he can help you score a little bit, if he can give you another threat out there, he's. I think he's more than worth the one-year investment you made here. If he can be a positive influence in the locker room, he can make a big difference on this team. If he defends, if he really takes defense seriously uh, in his one year at Purdue uh, and gives Purdue something close to what they need there, you know, that would be huge uh, because this team has to, has to get better defensively. I think if he's a guy who uses his size and strength, you know, to his advantage from a defensive perspective, I think suddenly you're looking at, maybe even an upgrade over what you lost in Isaiah Thompson to a lesser extent, Eric Hunter, you know, things like that. And, uh, but time will tell here, Um, you know, we're only speculating, but my first impression of him was just that he has a really big personality or a real energy about him, a real charisma about him. And I think that stuff can matter. All right. We're going to, we're, we're going to re- we're reaching, I don't know, statute of limitations on, uh, on uh, zoom interviews for, with COVID patients. But I did want to ask you on a personal level, cause you have a new dog and you haven't had a whole lot of time yet with that. Uh, but uh, tell us about that. Uh, we, we, we buried two cats in 2020 and we've been toying with the idea of getting back into that realm. What got you into the realm of getting a dog for all, re- for all God's well, sake? <laughs> we wanted to get our daughter a dog. We've been talking about it for years. Um, we just never got around to it. And I think the pandemic, um, us being home all the time gave the cat just an unbelievably false sense of reality (laughs) that we were here just to play with him. Um, and, uh, I found myself spending way too much time doing that instead of what I'm supposed to be doing for you. You have a great cat though. Oh, um, man. He is a great cat. He is my best friend, sadly. Yeah. Um, but uh, so I, I think another animal in the house we figured would, you know, perhaps give him something to entertain him to get him off our <laughs> ass. How, how that's going to mean, what is his name? Loki. Loki. And, and the dog's name? Uh, Nova. We just, okay. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure where that came from. That was, that was not Villanova, but like I know Nova. That's yeah. a, um, a PBS fame, <laughs> which actually, I believe in Spanish means it does not go. Yeah. <laughs> so okay. when we take her outside and she doesn't, she doesn't <laughs> do her business like she's supposed to. We can just say, well, we told her. Yeah. <laughs> when we called her to come out, we told her that she wasn't supposed to go because we called her Nova. Um, yeah. so. And you're right. I just looked it up. You're right. It does not go. It's but we Spanish. also probably might have made a little tactical error here by by naming the dog something that starts with N-O, no. So when she hears <laughs> the word no, that, that can go a couple different yeah, ways. I didn't think about that. So. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, it, it, it's been... Um, it's been so, f- it's been fun so far. I feel bad for, for my wife because now she's dealing with housebreaking the new puppy, um, uh, you know, refereeing between the puppy and the cat and <laughs> throwing bags of food in here every couple hours. Um, <laughs> while you're awake, while I just sleep. Yeah. All right. So. Well, all right. Good stuff. And, uh, we appreciate you, uh, uh, it's always good stories and uh, we're, we're, I know you're working your way back to health and it will get back to normal, but it's in the process. It's, it's a, uh, a challenge. So I want to thank our sponsors sponsor. I should say the uh, union club hotel, the 811 bistro 
Boiler Up Bar and uh, all the good folks there that uh, that make us have Vicky Wicks and company. We appreciate them. So uh, we'll be back next week. Uh, I would imagine that uh, we'll be talking a little bit more football. Tom Diener will be off on vacation, be back there as well. We'll hit that as we get into media day is now a whopping, uh, I guess it would be about next 11. Next week, isn't away. it? Yeah, 27? July 27th. Yeah, and it, this is going to air on the start of the 16th. So uh, be down in Indianapolis for that. So that will be the start of uh, with camp starting August 2nd for Purdue football. And, of course, leading into that uh, September 1st uh, season opener, going to be a big one against Penn State. So we'll look forward to that and, uh, and a lot to, lot to, lot of ground to cover before we get to opening day of college football. So, Brian, have a good uh, rest of your weekend and uh, continue to progress. And we'll be chatting with you uh, early next week. And again, thanks to all of you for watching, listening, or however you consume. And I know that's not the right word. I mess it up every time. Uh, consume our, our materials. Uh, but uh, we appreciate that as well. Have a great weekend, all.